Good afternoon, all. Excuse my raspy voice. I'm on the back end of a URI. I have no fever. It's not the flu. Don't worry. Uh, I sort of get this thing a couple times a year, so uh, uh, from time to time I have to take a little sip of water. But thank you for coming. Um, I am very gratified that you would take time out of your busy day uh, doing all the great things that we do here at Downstate to uh, come get a little update from me, but more importantly, your opportunity to dialogue with me uh, and to ask questions. And uh, I'm still a professor at heart, and as I used to tell my uh, medical student, there is no stupid question. Uh, there is no, uh, uh, you know, punitive measures for asking questions. Um, it's it's uh, my responsibility uh, as your president to answer questions as truthfully and as uh, fully as I know. So I look forward to your questions later. Uh, but I did want to take the time to give you an update on a few things that uh, uh, we've been working on uh, and things that I have felt very passionate about since uh, being appointed to the presidency here at Downstate uh, almost 10 months ago. Uh, so it's been a very busy 10 months, a uh, very busy fall, it's shaping up to be equally busy spring, um, and that's uh, sort of the pace that I'm used to. So. Uh, it's nothing, uh, nothing that I uh, shirk away from, so, uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, talk a little bit. Um, first thing is facility upgrades. Uh, one of the things I heard loud and clear uh, during uh, uh, my time as a prospective uh, president and also since being here is that we have a lot of facility needs, and we do. And so we've uh, very methodically tried to uh, work through a number of the most critical uh, facility needs. I will tell you, this week it's flood. Uh, we had another pipe break yesterday, uh, about 3 p.m., and it cascaded water down from the sixth floor uh, to the first floor. Um, so we're, we've been dealing with a number of sort of uh, pipe uh, flood issues over the last, uh, I guess, since it got cold. Um, and some of them have been totally related to the age of some of our pipes. Some of them, quite frankly, have been due to um, uh, sort of self-inflicted wounds on the part of, of uh, certain occupants of certain uh, parts of the building who uh, uh, forgot to close the window when, during that very cold snap over the holidays, and uh, we had uh, problems uh, in a couple offices, and then we couldn't get access to the offices because somebody had changed the lock, unbeknownst to our FMND uh, uh, crew. So a number of issues that we're working on, uh, needless to say, it, it does uh, present a challenge. Um, however, the first thing that we've done this fall is we've recruited an outstanding new vice president for facilities management and development. And I'd like Dr. Uh, James Minto to please stand. James, please stand. Uh, James is an electrical engineer. And as I told uh, Ms. Aronin and uh, HR, I was not going to appoint a facility director who did not have an engineering background. Uh, because we have so many engineering issues here, and James is not only an engineer, uh, but he's had extensive experience colleagues in both higher education and in the private sector. Most recently, he was at CUNY, um, at Kingsborough, right? York. York. CUNY York. Uh, prior to that, he was with uh, a number of other organizations, including Sodexo, uh, and has spent time both in the higher education sector and in the private sector, sort of back and forth over his career. He's also spent time in hospitals. Again, another important attribute that Mr. Walsh and I felt very strongly that our next facility director had to have an understanding of hospital facility needs and issues. And so I'm delighted that we were able to recruit uh, James Minto to uh, to downstate. In true downstate fashion, he, we've thrown him into the cauldron and he's had to deal with a number of unexpected issues. So I really want to thank James for coming, first of all, and then for really rolling up his sleeve and working with our outstanding FMND uh, team to deal with some really uh, tough issues. So thank you, James. Uh, the other thing is, um, as soon as I can get things renovated, I am. Um, and in fact, uh, one of the rooms that will be uh, Phase two is this room, the Alumni Auditorium. Remember, we did phase one last summer, uh, uh, sort of made the stage a little better, uh, but we're gonna do some more stuff in here, and I'll show you a couple pictures in a second. You may have noticed that they're starting to uh, 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 
excavate land on the back end of the hospital towards the emergency room. That is because we are putting in a fuel cell uh, with the help of the local utility companies. Uh, they came to us about seven months ago and said, look, downstate is a big energy hog in central Brooklyn. And if you will allow us to put uh, a large fuel cell um, area in front of the hospital, uh, we will remit a certain amount of money to you, almost, I think, a million dollars. Plus, you'll help us during the summer times when there's such high demand for electricity for air conditioning in central Brooklyn that it would be good for the environment. So, of course, uh, you know, we all have to be concerned about climate change and, and, and uh, trying to decrease our carbon footprint. Uh, so we, we made it past all the SUNY Central approval processes, and now we're seeing that that project is underway, and I'll show you a little picture about that. The other thing we're doing, we've invested, would you believe, a half million dollars almost to get a new ID card system here. The ID card system uh, that we've had has been here for many years. It requires particularly our physicians and nurses to have two ID cards, uh, but with the new system, you just have one e ID card and you'll be able to have access in terms of proximity readers, uh, plus some other security upgrades, again, to make sure that we're making things as, as safe and as usable as possible in terms of your in and out of our facilities. <coughs> Excuse me, restrooms. We've heard it loud and clear there are not enough restrooms on campus. Particularly from our, our women colleagues, I hear you. Uh, and with three women in my household, I really understand it. So we are uh, looking at reconfiguring many of the bathrooms uh, that we can. James and his team are looking uh, methodically at, at bathrooms on all the floors uh, to uh, expand their capacity when possible, but to get them nicer, uh, first of all, because, you know, again, this is something basic to, uh, to all of us is having good uh, uh, restroom facilities. So yes, I heard you loud and clear, and I concur that we have to do better. We've just launched an upgrading of our wayfinding signage in UHB. Uh, now, I'm still relatively new. I get lost in UHB, uh, but I also think, my gosh, what about the patients? Can the patients find radiology? Can they find this? Can they find that? So Ms. Winston and Mr. Walsh and the team at the UHB have uh, done a nice job of, of putting together a new, nice, improved wayfindage in, in the hospital. And I think, Bill, that's already started, correct? Right, so I'm very happy about that. Now, the other thing I'm very happy about is that we got folks out of those substandard trailers. And remember, I promised you that I wanted our colleagues out of those trailers uh, before the end of the year. And I think we did it. Uh, this is downstairs. Uh, when we started renovating the lower level of the library, and this was the progress where we put up these nice cubicles here. And uh, again, with nice work, environment for our hardworking uh, staff in uh, HR in particular, but also the Research Foundation, and who else is down there, Heidi? Purchasing, Purchasing yes. AR a a a is down there too, who else is down there? Payroll. Oh, payroll, yes, of course. How can we forget about payroll? <laughs> uh, so yes, I want our payroll people very happy. <laughs> um, so uh, again, I think we have accomplished what we wanted to, to get you into nicer, uh, facilities and to make you feel more a part of the community because when you were over across the street in the trailers you know you didn't see each other you didn't see anybody other than your own crowd it was hard to go out and get a, a, a meal at lunchtime because you had to go across the street if it's raining or it's too hot or it's snowing or it's too cold so again uh, I really do believe that you know we have to make sure that we provide you the best environment for your work your very important work on behalf of downstate and all of us so again, I'm very happy that we were able to get folks out of those trailers. Uh, this room, um, again, last year was phase one. We didn't have time to finish it all uh, before the fall. But the good news is we're gonna continue in May with improvements to this room. Every seat in this auditorium will go away. And this is the new seats right here. It will be a little wider, yes, it will have a, a nice kind of wood uh, veneer uh, end. We'll even put the nice uh, uh, State University of New York Downstate Health, uh, Health Science Center Brooklyn seal on the edge. It will be much nicer seating 
because this room is so heavily used for CME programs and, and all sorts of things that, uh, again, I, we just didn't have time to do it before my inauguration. Uh, but my mandate was that, okay, fine, let's get through the academic year, and as soon as we finish up, we're going to uh, get in here and change uh, all the seating. So again, uh, we suspect that that uh, will start uh, right after end of classes, right, James, around May 10-ish. It will probably take until end of June to get it done. Uh, but again, aggressive upgrade of our facilities for our learners. Also, every auditoria in the building, including the ones uh, one, two, and three over here, are going to get new uh, furniture as well. This is what it's going to look like. And the best part is there's going to be power and USB ports. Oh, I forgot to mention, there's going to be USB ports at the bottom of all this, too. Uh, so again, we have to recognize that we all have 99 devices, right? Our students have tablets and laptops, and so do you, so there's going to be power in all these seats. There's going to be a bar running under the new seats where you'll be able to plug in. So again, aggressive upgrade of our teaching and learning space. This does include faculty also, the three rooms uh, upstairs, the three main uh, uh, auditoria for medical student teaching. Every seat in those uh, teaching venues will be changed as well. So we're going to do it by color. So one floor will have the burgundy, one will have the alligator green as it's called, and one floor will have, it says umber, looks more like orange to me, but, uh, but again, so differentiation in terms of the classroom. In addition to that, uh, new flooring, uh, better sound panels, and new AV equipment, and new lighting. So again, aggressive upgrade of our teaching uh, facilities for both our learners and our professors is very important to me. Uh, this is, we're spending $1.7 million to upgrade all of the seating uh, campus-wide. So again, a significant investment on our part that, again, will reflect upon our learning community and, and make it easier for our faculty to teach, to do the great job that they do. Also, AV. We're changing out the AV and the boards. So again, uh, we'll work with the faculty and the deans on the proper technology to improve your teaching venues. But again, it's very important to me as an educational institution that we have top-notch educational uh, venues for both our learners and professors. This is the area outside that I mentioned with the fuel cells. So the fuel cells will go along the back edge of the uh, hospital. So they've already started the uh, trenching work. And this is what it'll look like after. So it will look, you know, it, it is technology, but it'll be nicely camouflaged like that. Uh, we may not need the bollards, right? We will not do the bollards, but it will have this nice wrought iron fence. So again, it'll be blend in, but again, the key feature is that it's going to save a lot of electricity uh, and uh, decrease our carbon footprint, uh, again, being good citizens of central Brooklyn uh, to help out in terms of the energy needs of, of fast-growing Brooklyn. Uh, the garage. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. I got to take a sip of water on that one. <laughs> Colleagues, we have done so much work on the garage. I've had two engineers come in here uh, and do real rigorous engineering assessments. And the bad news is that there's not much that can be done. And so, as I jokingly say in meetings, the garage is NFL, not for long. <laughs> and this is the reason. Uh, we have significant structural issues. Anytime you see rebar, that means you have significant uh, structural integrity problems that are almost impossible to remediate without spending a lot of money. And so much money that it doesn't make sense to fix it. And so this is the struggle we've had trying to uh, deal with this issue. Now, it is safe for the moment. Uh, so I don't want you to leave here and, and say, I've to move my car. Um, it is safe for the moment. Uh, but the engineer said, look, you can only get through probably another six to seven months of use with this garage. So again, we don't have an answer for you. We're, we're exploring, uh, pursuing some parking options across the street at Kings County. Uh, we're looking at some other uh, parking situations. So again, uh, we are working hard to figure out a best way to replace the potential loss of this garage, which I know will be uh, painful for many of you, uh, but it's something I feel we have to do because I don't want this thing falling down on you 
or anybody that parks there. Uh, and God forbid, I've already told the chancellor, if this thing falls down, it's front page of the New York Times. So she said, no, we should not have that happen. Uh, so again, we are, uh, again, I'm part of the other thing, we've already let the members of the assembly uh, know that we have a need for a new parking garage. I've had some preliminary architectural uh, uh, consultation that gives me a price range between 60 million to 110 million. Uh, it's gonna cost a lot of money. Uh, so again, part of my job is to try to get the resources to do these things. So we're working hard uh, with the chancellor, uh, with Chairman McCall, uh, and uh, to try to figure out how, fat, how we can get the money uh, to redo or build a new garage. Uh, again, the facility thing is just one piece, but again, transparency is very important to me. So as you know, we've done the nice project along the main corridor there with the glass doors, fire rated, very safe. Uh, but again, it's part of my philosophy that you know, administrators should not be walled off and behind closed doors and unapproachable to the community. So I'm very pleased with the message that that has sent. Uh, you know, uh, the President's Weekly Bulletin, we still get stunned at how much you like it. Uh, and I'm glad that you do like it because we, we think very carefully about what's in it. Uh, I have one rule about the bulletin. There is never a story about me. It's always about other people at Downstate. And I understand you, you like my, some of my book reviews, so I've been encouraged to do more of that. I shared some of the six books I'm trying to work through uh, right after the holidays. So again, I'll put personal touches in it uh, in terms of articles that I think that uh, I find compelling that I, I'll share with you from time to time. But more importantly, I want to talk about the good things that are going on at Downstate. When our students go away and, and win awards, when Rob Gore gets selected as a presidential fellow, that is a high achievement for Dr. Gore in our Department of Emergency Medicine. The presidential fellowship is a consortium of the Bush Library, the Clinton Library, and the, the two Bush libraries, the Clinton Library uh, and the Carter Library, to train future leaders for the nation. And here it is, our own Rob Gore has been selected from probably 2,000 nominations uh, to be a presidential fellow. So again, uh, student spotlights. We like to put things in about our students, our faculty, our staff. So if you have ideas, and I know you know people who do good work at this institution who you feel don't get enough recognition, let us know. We want to feature uh, those downstate uh, staff members. This town hall. Uh, I think is a good forum to hear from, you can hear from me. I want to thank Mike Lucchese. He started this when he was interim uh, uh, officer in charge. Mike, this was a great idea. Thank you. And uh, I believe in copycatting. Great idea. I'll use it too. Thank you, Mike. Uh, because again, you heard from Mike during the transition period uh, between presidents. So again, this, this forum was very important for him to communicate with you. And I said, Mike, this is a great idea. I want to continue it. So thanks. And we'll, we'll figure out how often to do this. Uh, my hunch is maybe twice a year, maybe three times a year. It won't be every month. I won't take away too much of your time. But I do want to find a, a schedule so that I can, uh, you know, brief you on updates uh, for the campus appropriately. <coughs> The other part of our communications and marketing is, again, you made it very clear that we had to get somebody here who knows how to do marketing. So we did. We got Dawn Walker. Is Dawn here? Uh, matter of fact, she's not here because she's dealing with a potential story in Cranes about one of our hospital issues, but we recruited Dawn Walker uh, from CUNY Kingsboro, but prior to that, she had been at uh, Medgar Evers and CUNY Central. Before that, she had been deputy press secretary to Mayor Bloomberg of the city of New York. Uh, so again, she has great uh, public sector and, and higher ed uh, exposure and experience dealing with communications and marketing. Uh, so Dawn has hit the ground running. Uh, she will be given the capacity to hire a few more people to help with marketing and communications to highlight the good work again that we're doing. Uh, she's gonna also look at our branding, our messaging, uh, and so forth. So Dawn, you'll get to meet. I'm sorry she's not here, but she's on the job dealing with a uh, very delicate matter uh, that, uh, that she had to with one of the local publications. The other thing I know, we have to have a stronger relationship with policymakers, and that's policymakers in Albany, 
uh, in Washington, uh, in City Hall, in Borough Hall, in the community boards, etc. So we were delighted to uh, uh, recruit. Where's Jelani? Back there. Wave your hand, Jelani. <laughs> Jelani, Jelani Deshong is a native of Brooklyn, uh, went to Hunter College, lives three or four blocks away. You walk to work in our community. I, I recruited him from uh, Lieutenant Governor uh, Hochul's staff. Um, he was the special assistant to the Lieutenant Governor uh, and, and uh, was really the day-to-day -day liaison between the office of the Lieutenant Governor and the office of the Governor. And so Jelani has extensive experience in state government. It just amazes me having walked through the halls of Albany. I can't get through the Capitol without somebody coming up to Jelani, shaking his hand, giving him a hug. That's how well respected he is in, in Albany. So I'm delighted that we recruited him to our team uh, because the governmental inf interface is very important. Uh, I spent four days in Albany last week. I'm headed to Albany tomorrow. We'll be there all weekend. Uh, again, tightening our relationship with the policymakers is very important. Again, because um, I think they sometimes have some uh, misguided notions about us or what we do, what we need. Uh, I tell them we need a new garage. I tell them about uh, some of the other things we're doing. I tell them about how we're contributing uh, to the health care of New York City and Brooklyn. So again, you can never o not over communicate to members uh, of the assembly. So that's why I'll be spending a lot of time in Albany between now and June uh, with Jelani's assistance. Uh, just last week, I met with the entire Brooklyn delegation with Chairman McCall, telling them about you, all the great things you're doing, from our students to our faculty, our staff, our needs, our aspirations, more importantly, about how we would like to advance downstate in the years ahead. So I spent an hour and a half uh, with the Brooklyn delegation with Chairman McCall. SUNY Central, I had dinner, one-on-one -on -one dinner with the Chancellor last week. She's been very supportive of uh, me since she entered the Chancellorship. Uh, she understands the challenges we have. Uh, so Chancellor Johnson is a big proponent of downstate. And so the fact that she invited me to a one-on-one -on -one dinner, I had a good two-hour dinner with her, we talked about a number of issues, a number of uh, uh, talk strategy in terms of how we can advance downstate. So again, keeping a great relationship with the Chancellor and SUNY Central is something I've worked on. Uh, again, federal. I will be going to Washington the week after next. Uh, Chairman McCall has asked me to go to Washington to visit with members of the Brooklyn congressional delegation. That is the, the congressman from Brooklyn uh, and Senator Schumer and Senator uh, Gillibrand uh, to go to Washington, spend three days making sure they know about downstate, how we contribute uh, to all the th things that we know we do, and to, again, to make sure that they keep us in mind in terms of federal support uh, going forward. Now, one Brooklyn. Um, as you know, um, I guess uh, during the part of the time of my candidacy, the Northwell report came out, which really dealt with how um, healthcare in Brooklyn should be reorganized. And, um, you know, I, I've been quite critical behind the scenes with the governor's staff to say, look, you did not do us any favors by leaving downstate out of the, uh, the Northwell report. And, uh, you know, they acknowledge it in private. They would never say that in public. Um, but be that as it may, my strategy has been to deeply engage with the new structure that has been created by the governor uh, the One Brooklyn Health Initiative. And what One Brooklyn does is that it uh, sort of uh, regionalizes the th three of the four community hospitals in this part of Brooklyn, Brookdale, uh, Kingsbrook, um, I'm blocking on the other, um, Interfaith, yes. And because the governor has been spending so much money propping up those hospitals because of their operating losses that he's gotten all three of those boards to dissolve They've created a new board called One Brooklyn that now will manage all that. And more importantly, he announced that he's investing $675 million of capital money into One Brooklyn. Now, again, I sure wish we would have been in that. But even though we're not, we're having discussions with One Brooklyn about how we can get a piece of the action in terms of specialty care. So we put together a proposal, a preliminary proposal for uh, downstate's clinical faculty to be the referral base for specialty care as they build out their primary care network all over Brooklyn. 
Uh, I'm, a, I'm a primary care general internist. One of the things I had to do every day was refer my patients for specialty care. We want them to refer to our specialists at Downstate. And so that's the strategy that we've employed. Uh, uh, Dean Patu, myself, Mr. Walsh, is to try to get as much of that specialty referral business, orthopedics, rheumatology, uh, endocrinology, gastroenterology, cardiology, all the ologies. I want all that kind of business uh, driven here because they can't go out and hire those outstanding clinicians quite easily. They're going to have a tough enough time recruiting family physicians and general internists and nurse practitioners and PAs to build out the primary care network in Brooklyn. So we want to be positioned as a specialty provider of choice for one Brooklyn. Uh, the other thing, uh, we, we are, uh, the dean will uh, shortly put out a notice, I think next week, that we are launching a, a nationwide search for a new chair, and in fact it's going to be a new department, a new department of family and community medicine. Not just department of family medicine, but a department of family and community medicine. And we've negotiated that whoever we attract to this job will also carry the title of Chief, uh, Populate, Chief of Population Health and Innovation for One Brooklyn. And they will be contributing to the salary of this new chair. So again, uh, bring, uh, tightly linking uh, our excellent clinical department of family medicine, expanding it to family and community medicine, and then tightly linking it to the One Brooklyn Initiative, again, as a, as a tactic uh, to grow our clinical base vis-a-vis uh, -vis our connections to One Brooklyn. And again, I, as, you, as you see, I really we're working hard on the specialty uh, linkage part of that as well. Now, internally, Ms. Dorsey, our VP for HR, came to me, I guess, uh, last spring and she said, you know, it's been a number of years since we've done an employee um, engagement and climate survey. I said, well, let's do it. And so I gave her full authorization to get a consultant. It took about four to six months for us to get organized and so forth. And uh, we pushed the survey out in the late fall, early fall, I'm sorry, early fall. And the results came in. Uh, we had about a 20% participation rate. It was an online survey, although there were paper surveys available for those who didn't want to do it online. 20%, uh, it's okay for a start. I'd like to see it get better but we were gratified by the 20%. Um, the overall satisfaction score with the top, level, top number being seven, uh, of those uh, folks who answered, Judy, how many uh, actual uh, folks uh, responded to the survey? 900. About 900, almost 1,000, right? So out of 1,000 responses, the overall satisfaction with Downstate was about 4.53. Not bad, I want it higher. Uh, now, this is the punchline, colleagues. The consultants said, Dr. Riley, your folks are terribly dedicated to Downstate. He said, but the issue is they have a frustrated dedication to Downstate. And I went home that night and I couldn't sleep. I tossed and turned all night saying, my gosh, frustrated dedication. Um, and it, it, it's, it stuck with me for a week, and I kept saying, Judy, my gosh, frustrated dedication. So, so let's unpack that a little bit. People love this place. That's why they spend 20, 30, 15, 10 years here. But sometimes they grit their teeth during that 20, 30, 25, and 40 years. And that's what the frustrated part is. They're frustrated about the lack of bathrooms. They're frustrated about our old facilities. They're frustrated about our purchasing process. They're frustrated about this and that. So, you know, as you've heard me say, I'm a half full type of guy, ha glass half full type of guy. So I said, okay, we can build on that. So we've asked Judy to meet with all the relevant sections to share the data. This is shock to the system. I know it's shock to the system. And it was intentional. We can't get better till we acknowledge, you know, our challenges. So there was a little bit of harumping behind this, saying, oh, well, should we release this doc? Yes, we're going to release it. And so, yes, we did. And so, again, uh, you know, the frustrated dedication I would like to change over time. 
I'd love to have the predominant response be happy dedication. If I can't get happy dedication, I'll take happier dedication. <laughs> so we're going to work on the things that drive people nuts around here. We know it's the bathrooms, it's this, but the other thing that drives people nuts, and it came through in a survey, that there's a feeling that there's a lack of accountability. And that came through loud and clear. And so, hear me well, we are going to, to do our dead level best to create a stronger culture of accountability here. And what that means is on a daily basis with supervisors, uh, with your coworkers, if there's people who are, are not recognizing that it is a privilege to work here. It is not a God-given right. <laughs> Moses did not put on the tablets, thou shalt work at Downstate. <laughs> so, for those members of our community who don't get it, we will help them <laughs> get it. And in some cases, if they don't get it, they're going to be gone. So, and my management team knows I, I'm a very trusting and patient boss, but there are certain things that are not tolerated. And so that is the type of culture I want to engender, create at this institution, colleagues. So give us some time. Be candid with us. Tell us your thoughts. Um, you know, the world is different now, so we have to create a stronger culture of accountability. And that means whether you're a student, whether you work in student affairs, whether you're a department chairman or a division chairman or uh, you're in housekeeping, it doesn't matter. We all have to be accountable. Everybody's got a boss. I got a boss. And one thing I learned as a young man, my first job, is that the boss may not always be right, but the boss is always the boss. <laughs> so we have to create that type of accountability here. So we're going to work on that. HR has been in, in, in empowered to do that, uh, to, to create workshops on how to supervise better, how to deal with conflict in the, wor in the workplace, I mean, basic management and supervisory skills. We're going to do a needs analysis. You tell us what you need to be a better uh, member of this community, and we'll try to get it for you over time. Um, so again, there, are, there were some good things. Uh, again, people love the place. They feel supported here, but they feel frustrated. So again, this is the punchline from the climate survey, and I thank you for uh, completing it, and, and uh, hear me well. We have read it. We're, we're analyzing it, and we're moving forward with it, moving on improvements. Last week, we released the Presidential uh, Transition Committee report. Where's Dr. Imperato? Dr. Imperato, please stand. Uh, Dr. Imperato was the co-chair. Uh, our Dean Emeritus of the School of Public Health and now our Senior Vice President and Chief Academic Officer. I want to salute Pat uh, for his outstanding leadership in steering a very impressive uh, group of faculty and staff who devoted uh, seven to eight months on the transition report, right? A year. a year. So he reminds me, a year. Um, and this was important to me because it's part of my philosophy about shared governance. I don't have all the answers, colleagues. I would never lie to you and tell you I do. And that's why I have to work collaboratively with our faculty and staff to get their view, their ideas, their input. And so those recommendations were released last week. And again, there was harumping behind the scenes. Dr. Riley, you sure you want to release this? Yes, I do. Come back to me next day. Dr. Riley, you still want to release this? Yes, I do. Come back to me third day. Dr. Riley, yes, get it out. <laughs> uh, so we did. So I want to thank Pat and uh, Dr. Eddie Vanderbilt who did it. Now, again, the report has recommendations, colleagues. Um, and those will now have to go through the prism of analysis, whether it's for resources, uh, doability, um, appropriateness, et cetera. Um, but as soon as we can move forward on some of these things, we will. Um, but again, this is part of shared governance and shared responsibility is for all, those of us in, in leadership to roll up our sleeves and work collaboratively. So that is the spirit in which I release the report. And I'll be happy to take questions about that in the Q&A. The other thing, we just impaneled a workplace misconduct, uh, I'm sorry, workplace conduct <laughs> policy. Ms. Aronin's always slapping me behind the scenes. Um, 
Look, we, we, we pick up the newspaper every day, and on social media there are examples of sexual harassment, of uh, bad behavior in the work, workplace, doesn't matter what industry, banking, entertainment, professional sports, academia, the technology, and we're all just stunned at some of the things we've been hearing. And I gotta tell you, as a nation, this has engendered a national conversation about this, as it should be. The treatment of women in the workplace has been horrible in some sectors. And again, intolerable. And so to the extent to which uh, we can all understand that the world has changed. Uh, prior to what happened with Harvey Weinstein and some of the other celebrated cases, um, that's a, an era and an epic and an attitude we will never uh, return to. And so again, we understand we've had issues here from time to time. And so that's why I want to take a step back and have a committee under Ms. Aronin's uh, leadership uh, to look at our workplace conduct policies, whether it be issues of sexual harassment, sexual inappropriateness, uh, bullying in the workplace. We, got, we had some, uh, some data about that. Um, whatever the range of misconduct is, we want to deal with it. Because the world has changed, colleagues. Uh, now it's a legal issue. More importantly, it's a moral issue and we have to get better at it. So I will wait for that uh, committee's recommendations. Uh, we will share the recommendations openly uh, with the community. But again, we have to have an environment where workplace conduct, proper workplace conduct, is embraced. Oh, we also have formed a space planning committee. Again, rationalizing how we do space around here. Uh, which again is very much needed in very complex organizations like this. Um, again, the spirit in which we're approaching all this is to get to a better downstate. Um, and you've heard me say it before, no institution is perfect. Perfection is not our goal. But being better is and excellence is our goal, not perfection. And so it's in the spirit that that's the way I approach my work every day, uh, to make this place better because it's a great place, no matter our frustrated dedication, no matter our lousy bathrooms, no matter you know, all the things that drive you nuts, this is still a great place that I wake up every morning uh, to defend in Albany or in City Hall or in Washington because I know what we do here and I know the impact of what you do whether you're a professor or you mop the floor or you run the studies or you organize the programs or you pick up the phone and make copies. I know what you do. And that's what makes a great community. And so that's the spirit in which uh, I do my work for a better downstate. I'll take questions. Thank you.